Do you like to break trail and get away from the crowds? Then step away from the mass of buses and explore Angkor Archaeological Park by winding through the back alleyways and side paths and revealing her hidden secrets which have been locked in stone for hundreds of years. Welcome to our travel adventure of Angkor, the seat of power for the ancient Khmer people. We are 17 weeks away from home now and settled into Siem Reap for a 21-day immersion into the past, present, and future of the capital megacity, which flourished from the 9th to the 15th centuries. We are a Canadian family of four exploring the world for a year. We are planning on visiting four continents, 18 countries, and 32 cities. Follow along for weekly videos posted every Sunday. Don't forget to hit subscribe on my channel devoted to creative wandering. In addition to videos about travel and creative projects, soon there will be details about my first retreat. I would love to hear from you in the comment section below this video. You can also shoot me an email or connect with me on any of my social channels. It is impossible to properly prepare for a tour of the Angkor Archaeological Park. The scale of the temples, the various civic structures, and the ruins are beyond comprehension. All of this was built without any modern equipment or engineering knowledge. And it's hard to believe that archaeologists believe this area supported the population of up to a million people, making the vast territory of Angkor the most important civilization of its time in Asia. First, the practicalities. You need to fly in to Siem Reap, which has an international airport and various number of flights coming in daily. Then you need to find a place to stay, probably with a pool. There is something to fit every budget, from student youth hostels to mid-price to posh resorts. Then you will need a visitor's pass, which comes in three forms, one day, three day, and seven day and the seven day can be used for up to a month. You can buy these passes on the way to your first visit. It's an official location. They will take your photo. The passes belong to you. They're not transferable and you cannot lose them. I'll provide a link below to that website, that official website, and you need to check it for the price of the passes when you visit. I've watched many videos that are quoting last year's prices and they actually went up this year. Then you need to book transportation. And this comes in a variety of different forms. You can go on a bike, you could take a guided bus tour, you could hire a cab for the day or a taxi driver, you could go by Tuk Tuk. And then if you're going to choose the self-guided route, which is what we did, you need to prioritize what you want to see. There is far too much even for a seven day pass. My only advice is to be careful of the most promoted, most popular sites because they will be busy at most times of the day. And sunrise at Angkor Wat is the most crowded experience of them all. As you can imagine, we decided to skip that because I think there is no photo that I can take that would be worth fighting the crowds at sunrise. Instead, we broke our first week of touring into three days. In this video, I'm gonna cover the very first day, which was focused on Angkor Thom. We started at 9 a.m., had a nice breakfast, and took the 7.2 kilometer trip by Tuk Tuk out to Angkor Thom. We entered the nine kilometer square complex through the south gate, and there are four of them which we could choose from. The first thing you see is almost a banister of divas on the left and asuras on the right. Each row is holding a naga in the attitude of tug of war, which appears to be a reference to the myth of the churning of the sea of milk. A causeway spans the moat in front of the tower where the eight meter high walls are built using laterite, buttressed by earth with a parapet on top. The faces on the 23 meter high towers at each of the four city gates are later additions to the main structure. Next, we headed over to North Kliang, a rectangular set of sandstone buildings of unknown purpose on the east side of the Royal Square in Angkor Thom. Kliang means storeroom, but it is unlikely that that was the function of these structures. 
A royal oath of allegiance is carved into the doorway, indicating that they may have served as reception areas, or even housing for visiting noblemen and ambassadors. We loved these ruins. While there is little left standing or restored, we had the space to ourselves, which left us ample time to wander freely and imagine what life was like at the end of the 10th century. Then, our tuk-tuk driver suggested we head over to the terrace, which meant we left the sanctuary of the trees to behold the platform from which the king would view his victorious returning army. We were in the full sun and had to start waiting our turn to view various parts of the site. Most of what remains are the foundation platforms of the complex, which was used as a giant reviewing stand for public ceremonies and served as the base for the king's grand audience hall. Towards either end are the two parts of the famous parade of elephants. Back into the forest for Finiamicus. Built at the end of the 10th century in the Kliang style, we would check out the gate at the entrance to the temple grounds, but the main structure is closed off from exploring. This Hindu temple is in the shape of a three-tier pyramid. On top of the pyramid there is a tower, while on the edge of the top platform there are galleries. Our tuk tuk driver instructed us to head towards the back of the site and enter the next temple from there. As it turned out, we were doing the whole tour backwards. Streams of people were going in the opposite direction, so we were kind of swimming against the tide, which was really nice. Otherwise, we would have been in a long queue. We entered Bathon, which was built in the mid-11th century from the back. It is another three-tiered temple mountain dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva. Evidently, it was described back in its day as the Tower of Bronze, a truly astonishing spectacle with more than 10 chambers at its base. Then, in the late 15th century, Bafon was converted to a Buddhist temple, including the addition of a 9 meter tall by 70 meter long statue of a reclining Buddha. The temple was built on land filled with sand, and due to its immense size, the site was unstable throughout its history. Large portions had probably already collapsed by the time the Buddha was added. By the 20th century, much of the temple had largely collapsed, and restoration efforts have since proved problematic. One of the features for tourists are a couple sets of extremely steep stairs leading to the top tiers of the temple. The climb is not for the faint of heart. You cannot be afraid of heights in any way, but the view of the surrounding area is pretty awesome. By this point, we were getting really hot and had to wait in line for the pleasure of climbing to the top. As the saying goes, last but not least, probably my most favorite temple is called Bayon. Built in the height of the Khmer Empire in the late 12th or 13th century as the official state temple for King Jayavarman VII. After his death, it was modified and augmented by later Hindu and Theravada Buddhist kings in accordance with their own religious preferences. Bayon's most distinctive feature is the multitude of serene and smiling stone faces on the many towers which jet out from the upper terrace and cluster around its central peak. The outer wall gallery features a series of bas reliefs depicting historical events and scenes from the everyday life of the Angkorian Khmer. Efforts to read some significance into the numbers of towers and faces at Bayon have proved problematic, as towers have been added through construction and lost to attrition over the years. At one point, the temple was host to 49 such towers. Now only 37 remain. The number of faces is approximately 200, but since some are only partially preserved, there can be no definitive count. One thing is for sure, it is a bit overwhelming. Every time you turn around, there is something else to look at, making Bayon a visual mystery. That was all we took in on our first day of temples. I don't think the mind can comprehend more than that. And we didn't want to become victim of thinking all the temples looked the same. Even if the temperatures were not hotter than anything we ever experienced at home during our summers, we knew we had to quit while we were ahead. It was time to go back to the pool and soak in this history lesson. Thanks for watching part one of our temple tour. For more information about our trip and creative inspiration in general, head over to dailycreatives.com. There you can find links to my three favorite things, books, videos, and courses. I update the blog two times per week with my thoughts on all things creative. See you there.